Well, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, Institute Encounters. We have today a very special guest, His Royal Highness Joram von Habsburg. Um, His Excellency is the grandson of the last reigning emperor of Austria-Hungary and the son of the last crown prince. Uh, there are, of course, many, or at least some other, um, famous dynastic families, but, but it seems to me uh, that it's only, only the Habsburgs who seem to have found a continuing mission in, in European life as a whole. Um, I think that's probably a, a, a tribute yes. in large measure to your father, uh, but it, it also um, stems, I think, from the very special role that the Habsburg monarchy played in, in European history, being a, a, a very much self-conscious multinational yes. uh, monarchy. Right. That is right. um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and, and maybe we can start our discussion in yes. this way, uh, how has the historical um, uh, role of the Habsburgs in Europe, uh, given uh, a definition to a, a contemporary mission for your family? How, how, how do the members of the family understand that? Um, first of all, of course, you have to say that um, the family is now since very long time in politics. So uh, my family has been practically always in different functions, politically active, and this, um, of course, gives you a kind of an interesting background when you look back on uh, what the family achieved or where difficulties have been. But what you mention is one of the, let's say, really clear lines you can see through all the centuries. And this is the idea that is called in German the Reichsidee. Reichsidee is something which is very, very complicated to translate because if you translate it into English and you say it's the imperial idea, everybody is going to think about uh, Maharaja in India taking tea or something like that. Or in French, if you say l'idée imperiale, it would be something connected with Napoleon or anything. But what is the Reichsidee? The Reichsidee was, is to put a supranational rule of law on the basis of subsidiarity. What did this mean? For the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was always kind of a grouping of different nations, languages, cultures, traditions, religions, it was very important to guarantee that all of these different groups would live together peacefully. So the only possibility of how to reach this was to put a structure above all these nations, that when they had some bilateral difficulties, that there was a new institution that would be able to help them to come over these difficulties, and where they also could refer to as a help for solving differences between the different nations, groups, ethnicities that were living one beside the other. And of course, this was based in the position of the emperor and the infrastructure that the emperor kept in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it is quite interesting to see that um, Europe paid a very high price when they, they decided about destroying that. They paid a very high price when nationalism was popping up after 1918, 1919, after the end of the First World War when the Austro-Hungarian Empire disappeared. We had a very high price when the continent came into the Second World War and uh, had to pay a very high price when communism was rising based on everything what has happened in the Second World War. So it is of course for somebody in the family very beautiful to see that with the European Union getting formed after the Second World War by some very brave politicians and on this idea of this kind of pan-Europe, pan-European movement, pan-European idea to, 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 to bring Europe together. A lot of elements that have been present in the Austro-Hungarian empires were taken over to um, also as, as, let's say, as some of the basis of the European Union. And my father was, of course, active in politics in all his life, unfortunately. He 
passed away recently with a very nice age of 98 years. And when I just think my father was born in 1912, what he has seen in all his life, historically what has happened that in Europe. Of fun, yes. Um, that uh, he was always politically active, of course in different positions because the monarchy was over. Um, he was working with the pan-European movement. He was trying to, 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 to help this European idea to grow and for him it was very important to be in the European Parliament as soon as there was freely elected European Parliament where he was representing Bavaria. And um, so he was of course the example for our family to show what is the continuation of, of, of representing this idea and how important it is also for our family to try to be politically active where we can be politically active and to take this idea forward. So I moved very quickly after the fall of communism back to Hungary and since 96 I'm working as an ambassador at large for European affairs of the Hungarian government and the good thing is that I'm able to work with every government whether it was coming from right or the left because in European questions they all had one intention. My sister is member of the Swedish parliament and is working in Swedish Parliament. I have another sister who is Georgian ambassador to Berlin. I have a sister who is active in Spanish politics. So we are in different countries um, and in different positions, um, working in politics, but following this, let's say, clear lines that we that we see in our history. Uh, one of the kind of big challenges for the Austrian uh, Empire was working out a compact between Austria and Hungary. Uh, and trying to um, uh, divide up and decentralize mm -hmm. decision-making power. Um, how do you think that's proceeding in, in, in Europe nowadays? I, of course, there, there is still a lot of place to improvement, uh, but you have to see um, how, in, in what a short time, the European Union succeeded in changing the perception of a whole continent. If you take European history and you see how many wars and how many difficulties were always present in European history and uh, now having 60 years of peace and stability, let's say, on, on the political field and um, bringing it to an absolutely, uh, let's say, that nobody could imagine that there would be a, a war in Europe between France and Germany or, or Czech Republic and Austria. Um, so I, I think one has, 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 has reached already um, uh, a lot in, um, in, in, in this development of the European Union. But of course you, can, uh, you, you still have to improve very much. You have to see how decision making is going to uh, take place in the European Union in the future. How the, uh, let's say, influence of the different member countries of the European Union has to be valued in all the decision making process. Where decisions that are only can be taken by consent, probably it would be better that they would be taken by a majority if you find the right key. And I think the Lisbon Treaty was working very strongly in this direction. So this is something that is developing. And it was also, um, while you were mentioning the agreement between Hungary and Austria, it was also not in a very easy berth to reach that. But when you see the economical benefit it was bringing as to Austria and to Hungary, um, that was, uh, the, 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 the result was wonderful at the end. Uh, the, the, there's the, the project of European Union is not altogether new. Um, after the Roman Empire fell, there were a variety of efforts in which your family was rather conspicuously involved to, uh, to recreate it. Um, none of them fully succeeded, uh, and of course you had in relatively modern times these kind of conquest efforts, Napoleon, Hitler, people like Stalin, people like that. Um, why do you think there's a chance of bringing this long-sought ideal off now in, in light of the difficulties in, in trying to create it in the past? Uh, first of all, the ones you were mentioning now were mostly trying to unite the continent by war. The difference is the European Union is trying to unite the continent on the basis of peace. And this is, a, first of all, a very big difference, which is a much more solid base to bring countries together because to convince them that how peace is going to help them, how economical advantages are going to help them, how 
um, how the different countries could benefit by this European Union working together, how um, the countries can, uh, you know, coexist beside each other and it's not the dominating of one against the others. This is an argument, you know, what we hear very often, how the European Union is dominated by the Germans and it's dominated by the French. Well, if you have several small countries working together, several Central European countries working together, they can speak with the same voice that the Germans do, or the French do, or the Spanish do, or the Italian do. So you can, you can work together with other countries and then suddenly you become a certain importance, of a very important importance in, the, in, the, in, the, in this kind of, of, of European Union. But um, let's say, of course, it, it is a um, historical process we are in for the moment. It's a historical process that went very well um, so far uh, where we are at, uh, at, at this actual stage. And um, it, will, it will take some time. But I think the European Union it will be able to convince by the success it, it had. And, um, well, that, that, that is, in my opinion, the most important. Well, saying somebody said that the, the test of a, of a union is not so much how well it does in good times, and, and for the most part, the post-war era yeah. has, has been pretty good times economically, but how it fares in adversity, mm -hmm. um, and the adversity can arise in a variety of ways. The adversity could be times turning bad for a protracted period. Uh, the adversity could be a threat from the outside, which requires the various states and their various interests to somehow come together yeah. to defend themselves. Um, we, we really haven't had that occasion yet. Uh, and I hope it won't come and, soon. But, but given human history, yes. <laughs> as, as, uh, as, as we've seen it forever, uh, those, those things do happen. It, it, do you think that there is a kind of core element of loyalty uh, in Europe that would allow it to pull together in, in a situation of adversity? Not just an understanding that there are a lot of practical advantages, but, uh, but a real emotional sense of common destiny and common purpose. Yeah. Um, let me start with the dangers, because I see the dangers not so much in kind of foreign pressures or, or economical difficulties. Um, I see the biggest danger in the capacity of people forgetting how Europe was looking like before having the European Union, forgetting about the dangers of national socialism and communism, forgetting about the dangers and difficulties um, this continent was facing for such a long time and suddenly forget how we came to the point where we are today. So this is probably sometimes a much bigger uh, danger than, uh, than, than some, some foreign pressure because when you have some dangers of war, some big conflicts approaching, normally you tend to group together and to defend yourself. But by forgetting what has happened and by forgetting what has led us to the position where we are today, this is a big danger. So Why we have to keep this occurring. Um, because people sometimes tend to not being so much interested in historical questions. They are much more they prefer much more to, to live in the here and now and think about the most imminent future. And um, you know my father very often said in speeches one very important sentence, this is, which, is, which accompanies me wherever I go. He said, the one who does not know where he comes from, does not know where he goes to, because he doesn't know where he is. And this is the most important thing. You have always to know where you come from and where you, where you want to go, because then you can define where you are at the moment. So I think this is the biggest danger that people forget where they come from and how complicated the situation was 30, 40, or even, or even worse, 60 years ago. So one has to work very intensively to maintain the knowledge about history. And this is an incredible task of schools and universities to maintain this alive, that people are, are understanding much better how fantastically well they are living and how easy we complain today about when we compare about how uh, people have suffered not too many years ago and how, many, how much people are suffering in other countries today on a, on a daily basis, and then they see that sometimes the complaints they are having are on a 
very low level when they when they can compare it in the difficulties that are existing in other countries that are not the United States or the European Union. So uh, this is one thing, but you have to be, um, you know, you have to, you, you have to help this European Union growing, and you cannot say now, you know, there's always some some two different groups in the European Union. The ones that say, let's stop here and let's try to, 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 to put the things together and to arrange everything that it works better. And let's not go on and enlarge the European Union. I am a completely different opinion. I think when the European Union stops enlarging, this would be also a very profound danger for the European Union. You have to go enlarging. You have to see what is happening in the neighboring countries of the European Union. You have to open up ways of discussion, trade, uh, political connections, um, um, assist countries that are neighboring with the European Union, because by this you even strengthen the, the stability of your own core European Union by, you know, discussing further enlargement towards Turkey, towards the Ukraine, um, uh, and, and you open new possibilities for the European Union economically. The countries become better when they start negotiating with the European Union economically, and this is also opening up new ways. So I think this process has to remain as a dynamic process for the future, and this is going to help strengthen the situation in the European Union by going on and lodging, by, by going you, you on You see discussing. that as the great unifying ideal, a continuing, continuing enlargement of this body of, of peacefully cooperating, democratically governed nations. Very nicely said, so. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, you know, and, and it's a debate now going on in American foreign policy, uh, of our uh, notion of Wilsonianism. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, president at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, thought of America's purpose in part of bringing peace and bringing democracy to the various nations of the world. Um, and a lot of Americans are now saying, we can't do that, that's too much. Mm -hmm. That involves uh, too much in the way of sacrifice and risk, and we have so many problems here that we need to deal with. Um, would that be a problem for the kind of project that you're outlining? I think the big difference is I'm talking about neighboring countries of the European Union. I don't see the European Union going around bringing peace and democracy to the whole world. I say very clearly it is for us very important that in the direct neighborhood of the European Union we start to have the best relations with the neighboring countries and try to bring there the values and ideas of the European Union and to convince through good example and possibilities, show the possibilities to these countries. What would it mean for them to join the European Union? What it can help them to get? First of all, you know, we talk so easily about peace and stability. It is so important, peace and stability. It's so easily said, you know, world peace, stability, democracy. If you see how important this is and what this means for the development of a country, this is this is something which is which is the real, really important thing. And I'm 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 not 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 talking about Africa, Asia, South America whatsoever. I say, stay within your neighborhood and see how your European Union can slowly grow step by step by working together with the neighboring countries by changing structures there that they come closer to the to the group of values that the European Union is representing. And this is one of the most important things that you have to have in front of your eyes for the uh, for the for the near future. And um, uh, this is once again this is a very long process. This is going to take a very long time. But it has to be a developing process. And by the moment the process stops, this will be dangerous for the European Union. So you have a notion of a historic Europe into which the European Union is growing, but it's a, a finite historic Europe. Um, yes, but I, 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 I wouldn't, um, you see, the, the difference is that I wouldn't talk about, about uh, borders and limits for mm -hmm. this European Union. Um, and I, I think we are, we are talking here about the project that should, that should go on for a lot of generations, mm -hmm. that for my kids, my grandchildren, for their children is still something which is, which is, which is ongoing, which is an ongoing hopefully success story to be. This is not, you know, today in politics we are always maximum thinking about four years, eight years, and all we have to do in this because next elections are coming. We lose sometimes the perspective for the next 50, 100, 150 years. And we, Europe, this is a project that should have a perspective for a very long time that should be limited. Last question. 
Um, the European Union obviously has learned something from the American experience in kind of unifying what were originally separate states and colonies into a single working, not without some difficulty, into a, a single working uh, nation. Uh, are there lessons that the European Union today has for the United States? Are there things that we Americans could learn from the experience of the European Union? Um, of course, we have a different point of departure because there is the, let's say, the, the big difference between the United States and Europe is, of course, in this incredible cultural diversity that has existed on the European continent. This is by the, the, the richness of, of, of languages, cultures that are, that are present. They are also present in the United States, but there is a very big unifying factor, which is the language, and um, which, is, which shouldn't happen in the European Union because the, 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 the cultures are best protected if they get the possibility to develop their, their own path and, their, and to go on developing their own culture, their own traditions. So this is something which, which is, is a big difference and which is uh, something that is very important um, in, the, in the European Union. But of course you should always learn from each other. Of course you should always learn, especially from the mistakes the others did. And um, if, you are, if, if you accept the other one as a, as a friend, and as a partner, and I, I would say America is the most important friend and partner that the European Union has and that Europe has. Um, you have to go and develop this friendship and, and uh, be sometimes very open to each other if, if there's happening something in a, in, in, in on the other side that you, that you don't like, but be constructive, work together, learn from the successes and, 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 and the mistakes and, and remain good partners in the future because our values are very similar, our intentions, our intentions are very similar. Um, we are very much dependent on the trade uh, with each other and we are very much in, interested that our trade from side of the European Union from America goes on globally so this is a this is a very lot of joint interests we have so we should kind of collaborate the best that's a positive note on which to end your excellency thank you very much thank you very much